Hey everyone, thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Mark Canny and I'm Manager of Lending Services at Lehigh University. I'm a member of the Folio Special Interest Group for Resource Access and the host for today's event. Our topic today is Folio Development Process. It takes a community. Today's session, like all Folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website. As an open forum, participants can see each other and all questions submitted. And we have muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. We value your participation and encourage you to engage the topic. So we have reserved time for questions and discussions. Please use the Q&A panel to enter questions and comments as they come to you. Our speakers will address the questions at the end of their presentation. If you like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. We also encourage you to continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio discussion website, discuss.folio.org. Our speakers today are Holly Misselbauer from Cornell University and Kate Borma from EBSCO. Welcome, Holly and Kate. Thank you, Mark. Um, for the presentation today, I'm going to be doing uh, pretty much the entire presentation. And then, uh, this is Holly. And then uh, when we get to the question and answer part, uh, Kate's going to step in and help me in, in answering the questions. So let me get started. Uh, for those of you who attended the September 27th forum uh, titled Resource Access SIG Report, uh, you will remember that that forum covered part of the development process and it was covered at a high level. So you can look at this forum as a deeper dive into that process. So we're going to cover various roles that are involved in the development process. And we're also going to show you the steps that the features and functions of Folio go through. And Folio is very much a community project that's being developed by individuals from all over the place. And I'm going to show you um, uh, a couple slides that a, a colleague put together. So the subtitle of my talk is It Takes a Community. And uh, it really is a very large community. In fact, uh, in order to show you uh, all of the logos for our community, it takes about three uh, slides now. Uh, so this gives you an idea of all of the different uh, partners working together uh, to produce Folio. Uh, so Olay is, is the open library environment. And you probably noticed on the opening slide that I'm part of Olay. Um, uh, because I work for Cornell and Cornell is part of Olay. Uh, and Kate Borma is uh, part of EBSCO. And there are probably people attending this forum who are uh, part of one of these other uh, organizations here. Uh, I happen to know there are people here from Index Data. Uh, and then we have uh, people from different universities uh, in the United States. And then we also have people from universities around the world. So our community is, is large and it's getting larger. Um, and we like to see it grow. So people who are interested in Folio uh, should let us know because we're very interested in having more people join us. And in fact, uh, yesterday I added to this slide um, the uh, UNAM uh, group. Uh, the University uh, of uh, National Auto, Automa, I, I'm not even saying it right, but anyway, they are in Mexico City and they are helping us develop uh, the fees and fines portion of, of Folio. So uh, this is just an example of how we are continuing to grow um, and we have a lot of people who are involved and um, like I said, if you're interested, please let us know. 
So the development process that we're using, uh, you'll hear people say that we're developing in an agile environment. And you may have heard of that already and maybe not. Uh, it's it's uh, not complicated. So for those of you who don't work in a development environment, um, yeah, I don't want you to start getting glossy eyed and thinking that it's going to be something that you, you uh, won't understand. Um, it's really uh, an umbrella term that's used for a lot of different uh, software methodologies. Um, so we're not going to get into the methodologies themselves. But you may have heard people talk about Scrum or Kanban, and they're all different forms of agile development. For example, I am a Scrum, a certified Scrum master. Um, so it just means that I have been certified in a methodology, uh, a, an agile methodology. And we're not using, as far as I know, a particular methodology on this project. We're just using a general agile approach to the project. And uh, they all agile uh, methodologies share a similar ph philosophy. And it's based on the uh, manifesto, the agile manifesto. And the agile manifest manifesto is very, very basic. Um, for those of you who were involved possibly in software development projects, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, um, you will know that the projects are developed today very different from how they were developed back in those days. Um, I have been developing software projects for 35 years. So um, I remember the bad old days uh, when uh, what would happen is we would um, meet with people who wanted us to develop something for them. And we would talk to them about what they wanted and we would design it and we would produce all kinds of paper uh, documenting the requirements and designing what the screens should look like and the reports and we would talk, 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 write, 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 write. And then we would go away and we would work for a year, two years, whatever. And we would create this software and then one day we would just show them the completed software and, uh, you know, that would be the system and we called it the big bang and one day the system wasn't there the next day it was and uh, it may or may not actually meet their needs their needs may have changed uh, the big thing was to try to keep things from changing uh, during the time the system was being developed which of course is so unrealistic uh, so the agile approach is basically the total opposite of what we were doing then uh, it makes total sense, uh, but for some reason, um, we weren't doing projects that way. Um, now we are. So what we're talking about now is that it's more important to interact with the people who are going to be using the software and interact with these people all the way through the process rather than just collecting information from them in the beginning and going away. And instead of focusing on you know, writing up documentation about what they want. Um, you know, focus on getting some software going. You know, work on, work on a, a small piece of software and show them what you've done and uh, get their response on, on this software. Um, and instead of being so focused on having your customers sign off, this is what we want, you know, work together with them on the project. Don't treat it like uh, you know, a, con a contractual arrangement, uh, treat it like a partnership and, and accept that change is going to happen, um, that it's, you know, you're not going to be uh, in, in working, it's, the world doesn't work in a way that you can just keep, uh, make everything stop and be the same two years from now or a year from now. Uh, things are going to change and you have to be willing to uh, change with it. Um, so it seems very basic now, but at the time it was pretty revolutionary. And so some of the principles, I'm not going to, I'm not going to read these to you. Um, but the, the, the most uh, revolutionary idea was that, you know, the highest priority is really to satisfy the customer. Um, and so I'm very pleased that uh, Folio is very focused on, on producing what uh, the users want. And the users in this case are 
the libraries that will be using Folio. And those libraries are represented on the project by subject matter experts uh, from various libraries who are members of our special interest groups, which we call SIGs. Um, so we're working very hard to uh, satisfy uh, the, libra the, the librarian experts who are um, basically defining what our features and functions uh, should do. And uh, we're delivering the software frequently, every, every two weeks. We have two week sprints and then we produce something that we can show. And uh, we, we build uh, the, the processes incrementally so that we can say, oh, here's a little piece of you know, the user, user information. What do you think? Oh, that's good. Okay, what else do we need to add? And so we don't march down a path uh, the wrong way and then have to totally redo it. Uh, we build on it slowly so that we make sure that we're doing uh, what the user wants from the get-go. The other thing that I like about the Agile approach is that uh, it also is a good environment for the developers to work in uh, because you really put, you, first of all, you put the developers uh, working with, with the users, but you also give the developers an environment in which they, they have more say-so about what, what's being done. Um, you, you hot, what you do is you make sure you have people who are very motivated and you make sure that you give them the support that they need and the tools that they need and uh, you let them uh, make some decisions about what they're going to work on and how they're going to do it. And um, so you end up with basically very happy customers and then very happy developers. Um, and that's a really, you know, that's a win-win uh, type situation. So some of the terminology uh, that's used is terminology that I'll be using today. So first of all, we have what's called a sprint, which I've already mentioned. Uh, some people call them iterations. Uh, I think there are all kinds of other names that people use for it. But a sprint is a fixed period of time uh, during which development of a usable result takes place. So what that means is that your project has specified a fixed period of time during which something is going to be done that you can show to someone else. Uh, so in Folio, what we're doing is we're doing two-week sprints. So what that means is that it's like a two-week mini project. Um, so at the end of two weeks, uh, we, we have something that we can show um, that we can say we produce during that two-week period. And so we do continuous two week sprints. So one sprint starts on a Monday and it ends the following Friday. And then the next sprint starts on that next Monday. So uh, it's a never ending um, sprint cycle. Um, we do make exceptions for, for holidays where they, the sprint might be extended. Um, but for the most part, they just keep going. Uh, there's another term that's used quite a bit that's called a backlog. And a backlog is basically a collection of, of the tasks, you know, what needs to be done uh, in order to deliver the product. So it's a collection of tasks that need to be done for us to complete Folio, you know, the first version of Folio, let's say. And we use a product called Jira, which is quite common now, um, to store our backlog. So Jira is an issue tracking system where you can enter issues and keep track of uh, the status of those issues and you can label the issues and do a lot of different things with them. And so we use JIRA to store our backlog. And um, it's just a nice way, it's kind of like an automated to-do list, I guess you could say. Um, user story, user stories are uh, what, we, what we use to actually um, express the work that needs to be done. So when we put a task in JIRA, um, we put it in JIRA as a user story. And a user story is a, is a functional increment of work. So in a library, you could look at it as something like um, checking out a book. Okay, so that's a function that happens in a library. Um, processing a lost book. 
So a book is lost. What are the things you have to do when a book is lost? Um, you may say, you know, buying a book. Um, so those kind of activities that happen, um, those are what's called user stories. Um, and like I said, we, we put the user stories in JIRA and the, the ones that are, you know, not being worked on right now become part of our backlog. So the product owner is the person responsible uh, for making sure that the developers are delivering uh, what, what the SIG, in our case, the SIG uh, wants. So we're representing, I'm a product owner, and I'm representing the users that I'm working with. So this is the, the people that are, the, the users in this case are the people on the SIG who are uh, defining what they want uh, Folio to do. And I'm representing them. I'm creating the user stories and working with the development team to make sure that uh, what the SIG wants is what is actually uh, being created and I'm testing the result and making sure that, um, that it works good. And uh, we also, uh, in our case, the lead product owner also prioritizes the backlog to make sure that uh, team developers who need work are getting the work. So sometimes we, you know, we have to prioritize so that the, the work is, is getting done in the right order. And then um, the last terminology is something called given when then. Um, I probably could have left this out, but I thought I would throw it in um, because I am going to be showing you something uh, related to this later. So it's a template style that we use to write uh, acceptance testings for a, acceptance tests for a user story. So it's just a style of, of writing um, uh, a user story that we've chosen to do. And it tells the developer what to do, but then it also acts like an acceptance test. So it's, it's, the format is given something, when something is carried out, then something should happen. So I gave an example here. So given the user details page, so this is the page that shows all the information about a given user, and I'm saying when it's displayed, then a fee find section should be displayed. Uh, and I'm telling when, how it should look on this page.jpg. So this is just an example. So then the developer would know, oh, on the user details page, I have to add this fees and fines section as it's being shown on page.jpg between addresses and loans. Um, so then they know what they need to do, and then the person testing it would know what, how, what to look for and how to test it. This is a very simple example, but just to kind of let you know, um, know how, how this would work. It takes a little getting used to. So on Folio, uh, the other thing that I want to make sure everybody understands is some of the roles that we have going on. So um, these are the main development roles we have. So I've already mentioned the SIG, the Special Interest Group. So these are members from libraries all over the place. So anybody can join a SIG uh, as long as you have the time um, to attend the meetings and, and do the work that, that's necessary. So right now we have 10 SIGs. Um, so we have user management, resource access, resource management, uh, metadata management, and, and several more. Um, and you can look at wiki.folio.org and see information about the SIGs and see what they're responsible for uh, if you're interested in, in joining one or seeing what they're, what they're up to. So this is what, we, what we, would, we would call our user groups. So these are the people who are going to use our applications. And so we want to find out from them what these applications should do. So the product own, owner, uh, this is the person who works with the SIG to determine what should be developed. So I'm a product owner. I work with the resource access SIG and we define, you know, what do you, what do you want? What, what do you want um, when you charge a fee or fine? You know, what kind of information do you want to collect? What should happen? 
And so I work with the, the SIG and I define user stories. Um, as I mentioned, Folio has several product owners. Um, there are some from Olay, uh, from EBSCO, uh, diff you know, different uh, groups have contributed product owners. And Kate Borma, who's from EBSCO, is a full-time product owner and she's the lead product owner. Um, so she's the one that, that makes sure that we um, you know, uh, know what we're doing and get assigned tasks uh, to work on and things like that. And then we have UX UI designers and those are the folks who actually design the pages and uh, help us to make sure that you know, we're, what we're trying to do kind of fits within the overall design of Folio. Um, because you don't want it to look like, you know, 14 different people have, have developed a uh, folio. You want it to look like a unified product. Um, so the UX designer works with the SIG and the product owner um, to do the design. And as with the product owners, um, there, there are several designers. Um, we have designers from EBSCO, Olay, and other organizations. And Philip Jakobsen is, is the lead designer for the, for the group. And then we have a development lead, which um, I've always been calling the project manager. Um, he kind of works you know, in the role of a project manager, but, he's, um, but he actually is more, you know, he's, he could work as a developer, so he's more of a development lead. Uh, he works with the product owner to determine the content for each sprint and so facilitates the work of the team by removing impediments. So what that means is that the development lead really works to make sure that the developers can do their job. So in the old days, the project manager kind of ran the show and kind of uh, told uh, people what they were going to work on and in what order. And uh, now the project manager role is more of a, a facilitator, making sure that people can do what they need to do, uh, have the tools they need. Um, and so the role is a little bit different. Um, but now, now in our case for Folio, Jakob is the development lead, so he also is involved in technical decisions and things like that as well. He's also leading the core team. So um, other teams have, um, we have multiple teams, so other teams have uh, development leads as well who are making uh, decision, you know, development uh, technical decisions for their teams. Um, but ja Jakob is the overall um, development lead and then the core team development lead. Developers. So we have a lot of developers working on Folio. And depending on how you count them, we have 40 to 50 developers. Uh, some are half-time, so um, you know you might count two half-time people as one. Uh, that's why I kind of went for 40 to 50, because they are separate individuals, but they may not work full-time on the project. And this is, I, I love this picture of the um, development team. Uh, the team actually meets face-to-face -face every four months. Um, this picture was taken in Montreal at the last meeting in September 2017, and the next meeting's planned for January. I didn't make it to this meeting, um, but I will be at the next one. And I don't know if you can see, can you see my mouse? Yep, there's Kate right there. Um, so this is, the development team consists of the developers, of course, uh, the product owners and the UX UI designers. And, um, you know, I very much consider the people who are on the SIGs to be members of the development team. Um, but it's rather difficult to get all, I mean, that would be another probably 80 people. Um, so the product owners very much represent the, the SIG members. Um, and so, so the product owners are the ones who, who go to the meetings and, um, and, and, and you know, attend the development team meetings. Mm -hmm. But I do consider the, the SIG members to very much be part of the development team. So at the, at the September 27th um, forum, 
uh, Kate, I believe, presented this requirements process. And it really is also the development process. So, um, excuse me, I needed a drink. Um, so it, it, it's, an, it's a nice diagram. Uh, it pretty much shows you what happens. Um, and we, you know, we, we get the, um, we know what needs to be in version one. We have a, a general design for what needs to be done. We work with the, the product owner, designer, and SIGs work together to come up with what, what the feature should look like. We, de we define a user story, the, developer, the developers work on it, we get, feedback, we get feedback, so then we work together to make it look like how it should. We do demos, uh, and then, the, then the, um, we go back to the SIG for feedback from the SIG. And um, so this is pretty much, you know, the complete process, really. Um, but I'm, so I just kind of wanted to recognize that that, that is a, a good, a good um, diagram. Uh, I just wanted to cover, um, I'm going to cover it a little bit differently, though. So before I get into how I'm going to cover it, um, the first question I think people probably probably wonder when you look at the fact that we have 40 to 50 people um, doing development on this, you're probably saying, how in the world do you know what to work on? I'm getting a message that my internet connection is unstable, so hopefully you're still hearing me. Um, so how do we know what to work on? Uh, because we have all these people, they're all over the place. Um, how do we keep from stepping on each other's toes? So. Folio has a high level plan, a roadmap, and it's very high level. So that it really doesn't tell you a lot about um, Okay, somebody told me I sound fine, so that's good. It doesn't really tell you a lot as far as details about what we're working on. So we do have something called the Development and Milestone Plan, or a lot of people call it the V1 document, and it has more detailed information. It's still not re real detailed, but it is more detailed than the roadmap. And you can find both of these as, at wiki.folio.org, right, right on the front page of that. So what this does is it shows you um, anything that has a one in this column here is part of version one. And if you look here, it says uh, feature name, import data, batch import of user records. Okay, so that tells you that we're gonna allow for the batch upload and importing of user records, which of course we have to do, uh, so that we can actually have all of our patrons uh, in the library database. Um, and, but it doesn't tell you how you're gonna do that. So this is something that the user management SIG would work on to try to define how that's actually gonna happen. Uh, so we know we're going to do that in version one, and then the user management SIG would work with a product owner and figure out how that's going to happen. So this is how we know what we're going to work on. And then if you look at the milestone tab of that uh, V1 document, you'll see, and I don't know if this is showing up very well, it doesn't look like it's great but it does show you the team that's working on, on this area. So, uh, gosh, I can't see this very well, but like user record, it shows you that index data is working on it. Kate is the PO and Kimi is the designer. So, so if you wanna know who's working on it, I mean, that, that would help you to find out. Um, and then this way we know somebody is working on it. Um, and if you have a question about that area or something that intersects with that area, you would know who to contact. Um, and if you wanna know who the actual developer is, you can go into JIRA and you'll find the name of the developer assigned to every task. Uh, so you can find specifically who is working on what. Um, so you, you always will know who is doing what. Um, which is really good. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through the process. Uh, there are, I believe, 12 steps. 
Um, I'm going to go through it rather quickly because it's a little dry. And then I'm going to um, go through two examples uh, of, of um, features that I've taken through the process, which will be, I hope, more interesting. Um, so rather than, you know, I like the diagram that, that Kate used in the last presentation, but I'm doing this more as a step-by-step. -step. Uh, and then I'll show you, uh, like I said, using a real example. So the first step, oh, and also keep in mind, please, that, that everything doesn't happen exactly like this every time uh, with every product owner, with every SIG. Um, you know, not everything lends itself to this exact process. So there might be somebody out there watching this saying, well, I'm on the, you know, user management SIG, and when we talked about X, we didn't do this exact process. And I believe you. I mean, I, I know that, that um, you know, this, this isn't going to be the process that's used, that maybe is followed every single time, um, but it is the process that we, certainly want to encourage people to use and um, hopefully uh, most of the work that we do uh, does follow this process. So the lead product owner, Kate, will assign the other product, the, a product owner uh, work on a particular function or feature. So Kate, when I started, Kate said, um, Holly, why don't you start on fees and fines? And then she said, let's start on, let's make it easy. Let's start on uh, manual fees and fines rather than automated ones. Um, so I thought, yeah, let's start slow. And that's what she said to me. And so that's how I knew what to start on. So then before I was going to meet with the SIG, uh, Kate said, why don't you look, in the, out what, look at what's in the current environment? bring some ideas to the SIG, because it's always better to start with something instead of saying, okay, what do you guys want to do? It's always better to say, you know, here's something I came up with. Um, and so I, I went and looked at um, what the Olay system was doing. I went and looked at, I, I, I work in a library, so I went downstairs and I said, hey, person who works the CERC desk, uh, can you show me how you charge how you charge manual fees like a locker fee or a Carol fee? And they showed me, and I said, "What do you like about this? What don't you like about this?" Um, and then I did some searching online at some documentation for some other systems, and and um, and I came up with a mock-up just to you know kind of a straw man just to get people talking. And then you work with the, then, then as product owner, I showed the SIG what I came up with and we started talking about it and um, came up with what we needed, you know, what, what the SIG felt was needed. Um, some of what I came up with was, was good. Uh, most of the time what, what happens is we need more. Um, and then they also give me the business logic, um, you know, what needs to happen when, when something when something is this value, then this needs to happen, or uh, error logic and things like that. So then, uh, after we had the mock-up kind of fine-tuned, uh, I create the product owner creates a Jira issue so that the UX UI designer can take that little mock-up and uh, do a design, come up with a very nice design, um, because the uh, because the UX UI designer, of course, uh, has actual design skills, unlike the product owner, and also knows uh, the guidelines for how we want our folio pages to look and can, you know, follow those guidelines. And um, usually the uh, UX UI designer comes back with something, I shouldn't say usually, always, the UX UI designer comes back with something that looks much better than what the product owner started with. Um, and then during this process, the UX UI designer and the product owner will go back and forth uh, talking about, um, you know, the designer will say, well, is there a reason that this was this way? And I'll say, well, no, that's just what, where I put it. Or I'll say, well, the SIG was pretty adamant that they wanted it that way. And so we'll go back and forth and sometimes I'll check with the SIG. 
And then the designer will create the design and, um, and then the SIG will agree that it meets the requirements. And then we'll go, the product owner, me, I'll create a JIRA for the developer in the form of a user story. So I'll go out in JIRA and do one of those uh, when then, when, well, whatever. Uh, I can't remember when then, what did I say it was? Anyway, I'll, what'd you say? Given. Given when then, thank you. I have, I have a couple people in the audience here, keeping me honest. Um, so then the product owner, okay, so then I create the user story. And then um, when there are enough user stories out there, uh, then, or I should say that when, when they're ready to plan the next sprint, uh, the lead product owner will meet with the dev lead and then identify the user stories for the next sprint. So um, uh, Kate will meet with Jakob and decide what, what should be in the next sprint, because Kate is representing the users in this case, and they will tag issues for the next sprint. Now, quite often, the product owner will be actually working with a team that is not part of the core, that, that is, will be working with a team that isn't the core team, and so they may be prioritizing the uh, issues on their own um, for example, with the fees and fines that I'm working on now, I'm working with uh, UNAM, not the core team. And so the prioritization may be handled different in that case. So then the de developers work on the user stories. And if they're not completed, then they're put back in the backlog for a future sprint. Um, I think most of the time they probably just end up working on them in the next sprint. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to happen that way because sometimes it ends up that something else becomes a higher priority in the meantime. So then product owners will test the work of the developers to make sure that the requirements were met. So it's important to know um, that, um, that the developers have completed the work um, properly. And also I just found out from Kate that there are gonna be some um, EBSCO people who are gonna be doing some testing. So that, that's actually good too, because then you have people who aren't familiar, who aren't so familiar with, with the work uh, testing it. And it's always good to have uh, another set of, of eyes. So then after two two week sprints, so that's four weeks, uh, a sprint review is held uh, in which the the work that has been done during those two two-week sprints uh, is presented by the developer. So who, the developer for whatever I or other product owners put in will present their work. And that change is also then presented to the SIG to verify that the work is correct. So this is the basic process that we go through. Okay, so now I'm gonna use an example. And the example I'm using is the patron checkout data. So I was, a I was originally assigned to work on fees and fines, but then I ended up working on this as a little side, uh, side effort and uh, ended up really enjoying it. So the first step, so up here I have the steps, and then I'm gonna show you uh, how it works out. So Kate asked me to work on uh, the patron checkout data. So this is, when a patron comes up and you scan their card, what data is gonna show up about that patron at that point? And so if you look at the, um, the V1 document that shows what uh, we should be working on, um, the bottom tabs have um, the various groups, the various SIGs, resource management, um, metadata management, and I can't see it because it's popping up the slide thing, but there's one that says resource access. There it is, resource access circulation. And so there is a, there is a, uh, 
requirement for allowing um, patrons to borrow books. Um, and that's where this particular requirement falls. Um, so we already had a, a page in place uh, because the developers were testing um, actually letting people check out books and we didn't really have a scan, uh, a way to scan cards or anything. So we were just putting in usernames and this information was popping up. So they just had a very basic information. Is the person active, their name, username and email. And so we were gonna design what we actually wanted to see on this side. Um, this other half of the screen uh, was going to be um, information about the items that the person was checking out. Um, so we were just focused on this half of the screen. So my job was to go to the, uh, to, was to review the current environment and bring some ideas to the SIG. So I used a tool called Balsamic, which allows you to do some little uh, mock-ups um, and I looked at what I thought you would want to know and I thought, okay, well, a picture of the person. So, you know, you've got the right person. Uh, you'd want to know their name, uh, if they're faculty, undergrad, grad, whatever, are they active and maybe how many items they already have loaned out. Um, and then this way, uh, the name would be a link to their full user details so that you could see everything about the person if you wanted to go look at them. And then items loaned, you could click on there and see all the items that they had checked out. So I thought, okay, that, that's what I'll present to the SIG. Um, so then I went to the SIG and we went through several iterations. Unfortunately, I don't have all of that um, all of the different iterations we went through. But we ended up with this. So you can see we ended up adding a lot more information. Um, first of all, we ended up adding another section uh, so that we could show uh, when, when a proxy was actually checking out a book for a patron. So in this case, Jane Doe is a graduate student who is checking out a book for a faculty member uh, named Julio Smith. And so we wanted to identify uh, Jane Doe. She's the one who brought us her borrower card and we scanned it, but she's actually checking out a book for Julio Smith. Um, so we wanted to show information for both people, the borrower and the proxy. So obviously if you're not a proxy, the second part would not even show up. So in addition to the information I originally had, uh, the SIG said, well, we also want to know, uh, you know, expiration date for their status. So, um, you know, if it's, a, if it's an undergraduate, you know, their relationship with the university may be expiring soon. Uh, they wanted to know the barcode. And then also some other information, like not just what's loaned, but do they have open requests? Are there items available? Uh, you know, did they request uh, items uh, be, be moved from, you know, one library to another? Uh, do they have interlibrary loan items available? And, um, you know, so you could tell them, hey, you've got three items available. And then if there are multiple locations, you know, hey, there's one right here, you know, right behind me. Um, also, do they owe fees and fines? I mean, this person owns, owes $150. Obviously, Julio's not there, so you're probably uh, not gonna be talking to the right person. Um, but you would, you would be able to mention um, the fees, fines. Um, if there are recalls, there's two recalls, and there are four overdue books. Now, recognizing, first of all, that when the desk is really, really busy, the likelihood of anybody saying anything about any of this is probably slim. Um, but, you know, there, there may be cases where you're able to say something. Um, some libraries, the fines just automatically get transferred somewhere, and so you may not ever see fees. I mean, there are all, all different kind of cases here. Um, the other thing that we haven't talked about yet 
uh, but we have we put it in our parking lot, so to say, so to speak, is you know there may be patrons that are blocked for some reason or another, and so we have to add a way to block uh, a patron from from checking out books. Okay, so in this case, this was a proxy, but you're not going to we we have to have a way to know if Jane Doe, when we scan her card, is she going to be acting as a proxy for for Julio Smith or someone else, or is she just gonna be checking out books for herself? So we had to do a screen, a little pop-up or something, where we can ask Jane Doe, who is she acting as? Because if we, if we wait for her to tell us, um, we might end up scanning her in as herself and then having her say, oh no, I'm really checking out books for Julio Smith. So we wanna find out right away. So this way we can say, hey, Jane Doe, who are you acting as? And she can, you know, most of the time she's probably acting as herself, but uh, she might be acting as a sponsor for, on behalf of one of her sponsors. So this way we can ask her um, and then she can say, oh yeah, I'm acting as Julio Smith. And then we can click Julio Smith and continue. And then we would get the page that I just showed you. Um, so try and, and the, 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 the SIG was very adamant that hitting enter should not work. Um, they want p the person at the desk to actually have to hit continue, uh, to make a choice and hit continue, um, in, in this particular case. So we, once we had that all worked out, uh, then, um, it, then I created a user, um, I created a um, JIRA issue for the UX UI designer to create, uh, to create what we call them mock-ups, but basically to create the design. And I actually was new and I forgot to do that, so Kate did it for me. Thank you, Kate. Um, and then through the, through the JIRA issue, you can communicate with the designer. The designer can ask you questions, you can ask the designer questions, and by doing this, the JIRA issue actually has the history of the, um, of the task at hand. So then this way, um, you, you always know uh, what went on, like what decisions were made and what the answers were. And anybody can find it. And that, that's the beauty of JIRA, to tell you the truth. So this is what Kimi came up with. And um, you'll notice a few things changed. Uh, for one, uh, the picture was made much smaller and was moved to the side, to the right, which made total sense because a lot of our libraries will not even have pictures. And this way, if the picture isn't there, it just, there will be nothing here and it will be, no one will be the wiser. Um, she also made the segregation between the proxy and the borrower more noticeable. But with this gray, I don't know if you can see, yeah, you, can, you should probably be able to see it. This gray box around the uh, proxy and the borrower. She moved the barcode up with the borrower. Um, a couple field names ended up being changed. I think we call this institution status and expiration date or something like that. And um, the user management SIG, uh, we showed this to the user management SIG and they felt that we should call these this is user data and they felt that we should call this data status and user expiration, uh, which we did. So th that's an example of cross SIG collaboration there. Um, items available, we moved at this location, we moved it right in with the item available information. Uh, so you can see that, that Kimi, um, you know, took, took what we did and then, um, you know, used, uh, used the, the names and the style uh, that would work the best uh, as far as fitting into Folio. And then also the fact that we knew we weren't going to have pictures for everyone. Uh, and in fact, that most libraries would probably not have pictures and that it just worked out better to, um, to put the pictures on the right so that they, if you don't have one, it doesn't affect this, the page at all. So, and then who are you acting as? Uh, it ended up being designed like this. 
And most of the time, you are not going to have this many sponsors, but we just wanted to show the developer uh, if there are a lot of sponsors, they should show up like this so that uh, there's three columns. Um, normally, you would not have that many um, people. So then I created a user story uh, for the developer. And this, you can see the given when then statements. Um, so there are scenarios. Um, so I'm saying given a patron who has no active relationships, so has no proxy relationships, when selected on the checkout page, um, display checkout patron without proxy. So I'm giving you information about how I'm giving the, the developer information about how to display um, the patron information. And then there are some things in this particular story that are out of scope. Uh, the reason it's out of scope is because we haven't completed um, some of the information, like, like some of the requests, uh, number of requests available at this location, at other locations, that information hasn't, it isn't even available right now. So they can't really put it in the, in the, um, on the page because we don't even have it. So then uh, the user story was done and it was ready to be assigned to someone. So uh, Kate, the lead product owner, met with Jakob and assigned the story. And so that's when you start seeing these labels. So this is how we keep track of what's going on with each JIRA task. Um, so it was assigned to Sprint 22, Team 2, uh, Michael, who was assigned the issue, he is on uh, team two. And then um, it ended up going into sprint 23. I think we had some issues that had to be worked out. And then it ended up being demoed um, at the end of sprint 23. And so this is just a really nice way of keeping track. You can always do a report and say, what was in sprint 22? What was in sprint 23? Uh, what did we demo in, in demo 23? So it's a very nice way of keeping track of, of what's going on with, um, with the issues. So uh, the developer then in Sprint 23, it was assigned to Mikkel. He started working on it and then through the process, um, it first was assigned to someone else. So I made a couple changes. So then I put some notes, uh, a comment in here in the JIRA issue explaining um, that we changed institution status to just status and that the picture was moved from left to the right um, and just communicating with the developer to let them know of changes that have been made. Because if you add a comment to, to JIRA, an email is sent to the developer and then they'll know what's going on. And then Michael ended up getting assigned the task and then he communicated that he had a couple of screen prints to show me. And so that's how we communicate back and forth. Uh, we also use Slack and other tools, but uh, JIRA is a, is a nice one because it keeps the history all together. So then, um, so then when, when Michael McCall was done with his work, he labeled the user story as in review. So he was done. So then I knew to go and check the user story and do testing. And then um, after that, I was able to say that it passed the test and I could close it. Um, and then sometimes if we get a backlog, other product owners will test the user stories. And then also, um, uh, as I mentioned, EBSCO has some additional people who are going to be helping with testing. So, um, you know, trying to make sure that we thoroughly test um, the stories. And then also, we also have a um, regression testing, uh, some automated testing that gets done to make sure that our products uh, or our changes that we make in the future don't break other things. Um, that, that we didn't touch, but we want to make sure that they didn't inadvertently uh, break. And then um, this change here to the patron data was presented at a sprint review on October 10th. And then just to show you how flexible this project is, 
we did present this to the SIG, and then we started talking about what should be in scanned items. And when we started talking about that, we realized that we really needed more of the screen real estate for scanned items. Um, that the patron data was interesting, but it wasn't the main part of what we wanted to see at, at checkout. So we realized that we really wanted maybe a third of the screen for patrons and two thirds of the screen for scanned items. So we were already changing it. So this is that whole flexibility that comes from the agile environment. And in fact, uh, I, I actually first did the, the presentation for a month ago. And recently, uh, I, I saw the iteration of the, the latest iteration of the um, of this page and saw that the patron data has indeed been uh, moved over to a third of the page. And now the scanned items uh, fits nicely in table format so that you can sort each column and, um, and see all the information that, that you need to see over there. Um, so anyway, it ended up being very nice. Um, I'm not sure this has actually been released yet. Uh, it might still be in design, but uh, anyway, just to show you kind of how things evolve in this project and how, um, how we're able to do that uh, based on uh, needs that come up, uh, we're able to quickly respond and, and ch make changes based on what the SIG uh, needs. Uh, so another example, I'll speed this one up a little bit. So the next example I'm going to do is um, charging um, manual fees and fines. So once again, Kate, the lead designer, the lead product owner, talked to me about uh, working on charging fees and fines. So on the V1 document, there is a feature called create fines and refunds. Circulation staff frequently manually creates fees, fines, refunds for a variety of reasons, including sale of privileges or products. Uh, so that is um, what, what I'm gonna be working on or what I started working on. And once again, I mean, it's, it's vague. I mean, this is why you need the SIG to work with you and, and um, tell you how it should look. So once again, you know, I work with, uh, on this one, this is the one where I actually went downstairs at my library and said, you know, show me how this works and tell me what you would really like it to do. And um, I met with um, someone at the University of Chicago who uses the Olay system and said, you know, he spent an hour with me and showed me everything that they do with fees and fines. And I met with other people just to try to get some background. So um, this is what I presented. Um, can't remember now if the barcode is there or not. But anyway, I figured you need to know, uh, I think I might have just called this location back then, but you need to know who is going to get the money. So who is owed this fee or fine? Uh, in some cases, I know at the University of Chicago, all the money goes to one location. So they won't have these multiple locations. Um, the fee type. Um, so what kind of fees, fees and fines do you have? Um, not everybody has the same ones. Um, so we have to have a table. So each, each fee owner so each of these locations can have their own list of fees and fines. I know there are some libraries that do, um, they do bus passes and everything else. Um, they s actually sell things. Um, so there's all kinds of, of possibilities um, for what can be, what can be uh, here. There's a fee amount that has to be entered. And then sometimes the fee is actually tied to an item. So that could be um, a book, um, a, a piece of equipment that's barcoded in the library. Um, so we have to be able to, um, to maybe tie it to an item. And then there's notes. 
uh, there's always a note um, that needs to be entered, maybe not for a carol or a locker, but for damaged books and missing things, there's usually a note that has to go in there. So uh, once again, I created this with Balsamic. And then I met with the um, SIG and we went through a lot of different process, you know, processes that didn't magically look like this. Um, but we came to the realization that, um, you know, we needed to be able to add that. Oops, didn't mean to do that. That or tax. Um, we also have a table, the table where you, I don't, I don't have a screen, an image here, but there's a table where you can put in for main library. These are all of the fees we have. You can also assign a dollar amount to them. Um, so you can have a dollar amount for everything. Uh, you can have the tax uh, amount in there. And then uh, you can um, automatically populate the fee and, and tax and all that with the option to change it um, when you get here. And then um, you can also search for a barcode or title. So you can scan or type in a barcode or title to find, um, to find an item if you want to associate the fee with an item here. Um, and then your options uh, at the end are to only to just charge the item. There's a button for charge only, charge and pay now or cancel. Uh, so we added that too. And then we also need to be able to remove the tax if, if the charge is a tax exempt charge. So there's so many things you've got to consider um, when you're doing this. So I worked with the SIG quite a bit on this and um, I think we came up with a good plan. So I created a JIRA issue for the designer, Kimi, to come up with the, the pretty design, I like to call it the pretty design, for charging manual fees. And there were some changes made because uh, I noticed through this process that we kept saying, uh, we, kept, we kept going back and forth between calling things a fee and calling things a fine. And so, I asked the group, should we just call everything a fee slash fine? And they said, yes. So I had to ask Kimi to make those changes. So this all happens in the JIRA issue, all this communication. Um, and then Kimi telling me, oh, you should see the edits here. And then me saying, you know, great, it looks good. Um, so it's a, it's a very good way to communicate with each other through the JIRA. So, um, so this is how it looks and you can, you know, looking at this, you'll probably say, hey, that looks a lot different from what, from what you did. Well, that's because Kimi is a designer. She knows what she's doing. Um, and so, and wanting to make it look like the other pages where the buttons are here. Um, and so the fee, the fee owners here, the fee type, and then the amount and the VAT tax, and then the totals here. Um, and then this part, pretty much looks the same as, as what it looked on the other. Um, so anyway, uh, turned out pretty nice. Um, it has the same information that, that we wanted, um, but it certainly uh, looks much, much nicer. Um, and then there was something else Kimi had to do uh, because uh, we want to be able to charge this new fee and fine from different locations. So on the open loan page, uh, Kimi had to add new fee fine option um, as something you could do with a loan. So if someone had a loan out for a camera, we, she, we wanted to be able to charge a new fee fine if that camera um, became damaged or an SD card was missing or a cable was missing or something, we wanted to be able to charge a fine uh, directly for that item. Um, so she needed to also add that option here. So she wasn't creating a whole new page like she did with the charge fee fine, but she did have to create uh, a new option. And then I created a user story uh, for the developer 
um, who is not, not yet working on this. Well, they've started working on it, but I have to get them to assign it to themselves. Um, so I did the same give and when then format. Um, so you can see the different scenarios that I created for that. Um, the other thing with this page, I didn't ask the designer to do this, but I did include this in the issue for the developer, is that uh, you also have to be able to create a fee fine uh, uh, from the patron, from the user details page. So this is the user details here. Um, and I just kind of doctored it up to include a fee fine section uh, where you could charge a fee fine. Um, it didn't seem to warrant, warrant an actual design. Um, so I'm asking the developer to add, to add that part here between the address and the loans um, and make it look like how the loans look. And actually today I realized that we should also have the total fees fines in here because that's going to be of interest to people. Um, not sure why I didn't think about it before, but I'm going to mention that at the SIG meeting tomorrow. Um, and so this is set for the next sprint. It's ready to go, um, but it hasn't been officially assigned yet. So the work is getting started. Uh, this is what I was mentioning that the UNAM group, the, the university in Mexico City, uh, is going to work on and they've actually started working on it and so um, I'll be the product owner working with their team and communicating we're communicating via slack and JIRA issues and also weekly meetings and we're not to this point yet but we'll follow the same standard where the same process where the issues will be set to in review and then I'll look at the issues and make sure that they're done and then we'll We'll close the issues once we're satisfied that that the um, that the uh, that the code is doing what the the what the SIG wants it to do, and then um, the UNAM will then present their uh, their work at the sprint review that that the core team does as well, and the other the other groups that I mentioned that are doing development, they're also presenting at the sprint review. Um, we've been doing that for a while now uh, so that everybody can see what everybody else is doing. And then I'll show it to the, um, the SIG as well. So that's two examples of, of work that I have personally worked on and how we went through the process. Um, it, I, I was trying to really show you how we communicate, how we know what to work on, how we keep track of who is working on what, um, because there are so many people working on this and we're so scattered. Um, and so we, you know, communication is key uh, to keeping things straight and having a process that people follow is also key. Um, the slide that I'm showing now was one that was in the SIG or excuse me, the forum on September 27th. I thought it was a really good, a really good slide. I think I, the next one is from them as well. I think one thing that we're learning is that so much of what we do now uh, are actually workarounds uh, for our current systems. Uh, recently, um, about a month ago, two people from EBSCO came to Cornell here and uh, a couple of us here also join them and they spent a day and a half learning what happens at the circulation desk and I know I was shocked at how little of what happens it actually uses Voyager actually uses our ILS uh, so much of what happens uses other applications or just other processes that have been developed uh, because uh, the ILS uh, couldn't do what they needed to do. And so it was very interesting to me to see, um, you know, how, how little was actually being done by the ILS. Um, so it was a real eye opener. Um, so um, 
let's see here. Um, what do we get from this? Um, I think the, the top thing that, that we're all getting from this is uh, we're getting a system that's going to work for us. Uh, and we're developing a system that, that's going to work for everybody. So uh, it's not just uh, a system that's going to work for Cornell. Uh, it's a system that's going to work for all the institutions. So the thinking is that if we have a dozen institutions, all different backgrounds, you know, some are cons work in consortias, consortiums and some are small and some are large. And, you know, the, the hope is that we're, we're coming up with something that will work for a variety of libraries. And hopefully that means it'll work for, for all of them. Um, and so, uh, so the hope is that we're developing something that will work for everyone. And I think that those of us who maybe aren't going to be users of the application, what we're hoping to get out of this is the satisfaction of knowing that we created something that's going to work for, for everyone and be, you know, the best ILS that, that's out there. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Holly. As we move into questions and comments, and, and again, please use the Q&A panel if you do have any. Um, I just want to say from my experience as a member of the RA SIG, um, it, it really has been remarkable the degree to which um, the product owners and the, de and the developers have been embedded with us and interacting with us on a, on a weekly basis um, and listening to our perspective on things. Um, so Holly, I just would ask, um, um, more generally, aside from our sake, um, how frequently are the, the developers and product owners and UX, UI folks um, meeting with the SIGs? Uh, I can't really say because I'm, I think for the most part, the product owners are all, almost always a part of the scenario. Um, the designers will probably come and go as needed as well as the developers. Maybe Kate, uh, maybe Kate has a better idea because she's the lead product owner. Sure, yeah. Um, so the SIGs are generally meeting at least once a week. In the RA SIGs case, it's twice a week. And uh, I think for the most part, the product owners are always at those meetings. Um, and um, the UX designers tend to be as well. There's, there are some groups where um, we don't have, or, or some features where there isn't a need for UX design. For example, when um, Kathleen was working, uh, she's a product owner from Coolto, was working with the user management SIG on user import. There really wasn't a whole lot of UI there. So um, she, you know, kind of drove the conversations and there wasn't a UX designer in attendance. But um, for the most part, we have both POs and UX designers on all those calls, all the SIG meetings. Okay, so some uh, feedback from one of our part from one of our attendees. Um, a patron name is Julio Dash Smith on the borrower's card, but on the charge manual fee, it's Smith Dash Julio. It would be nice to have consistency with last name or first name. Oh, that's actually a very good comment. Um, some of my screens on here are, uh, I think some of the screen pictures that I took are old because I noticed one other place where I had it wrong. It is, it, Kate, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's going to be last name, comma, first name. Yeah, that's what we have right now is we're trying yeah. to stick to last name, comma, first name everywhere it displays. Yeah. So sorry about that if, if, if it was confusing, but yes, that's that's a, I'm glad somebody pointed that out because that's one thing that we're really focused on now is trying to make sure that we're, we're consistent everywhere. Okay, here's, uh, here's a question. If we aren't a member of a SIG, is there any way we can make suggestions about ideas of suggestions or functions that we would like to see included? Um, yeah, so we have the discuss forum might be a good place for this. Um, so the, the folio discuss is, is where 
people raise ideas um, and start threads and they are asynchronous. So they happen outside of the SIGs and anybody can, can raise something on Discuss, I believe. Um, Peter can correct me if I'm wrong, if he's on this call. Um, and yeah, and then anyone who's, who's following um, in the community can comment and react. And that's a great way, I think, to get to funnel ideas into, um, into the discussion. And also, um, anybody can join a SIG. So, um, so I just want to make it clear that, um, you know, I, you're not, maybe you don't want to join a SIG and that's why you're asking the question. You just want to put this out there. Um, but please know that you can join a SIG. Um, so if you want to look out at uh, wiki.folio.org, you can see the different SIGs. And then if you go to the SIG page in the wiki, you can see who the convener is and contact that person. Um, that's another way um, to become involved. You don't have to be, you know, with a particular organization that's listed or anything. Everybody is welcome. Um, but yeah, if you don't want, if you, if you, if you just really just want to give it, put an idea out there and you don't really want to be engaged in a, long-term relationship with a SIG, then by all means, if you go to, um, somebody just sent me the, you go to discuss.folio.org, um, you can actually start a discussion about something. You can recommend something and then people can respond to it. Holly, uh, in your presentation, you used the term uh, parking lot and also backlog. Is there a distinction between those two things? Oh, what was the other one I used? Parking lot and? Backlog. Oh, okay. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have mentioned the parking lot. Um, <laughs> what the parking lot really is, is, okay, so the backlog, that contains work that we've defined and it's in JIRA and we're gonna work on it. It's, it's ready for a sprint. Whereas the parking lot, let me see if I can find the parking lot. Um, the parking lot is really, um, where's the wiki? Um, we, we were having discussions about various issues and um, Here it is, resource access parking lot. And sometimes we would go off on tangents that we weren't ready really to talk about right now. And uh, so we started this parking lot of things that were not defined at all yet, but we didn't want to forget about them. That's where I ended up putting patron blocks because we need to talk about patron blocks, but we weren't really ready to define that yet. Permission overrides. Um, what happens with Bursar? You know, we haven't talked about transferring fees to Bursar. Um, so we've just been keeping this um, kind of running list of things related to loans um, and, and different things that we still need to flesh out. And so that's what the parking lot is, just a place where we won't forget those things that we still need to work out. Whereas in the backlog, those are things that have already been fleshed out. Okay. Uh, one question that came in through chat, and I think it um, might be worth highlighting, is, um, is the JIRA um, publicly available and is a login required? JIRA is publicly available. It's at Folio, let me see. Uh, you only need, as far as I know, you only need a login. Yeah, because sometimes I'm not even logged in. You only need a login if you're going to actually try to change something. Um, so it's issues.folio.org. And uh, there are a bunch of uh, projects out here. Um, the ones you want to look for, the ones, well, I mean, you could look at any of them. Uh, but the ones that, that I'm mostly focused on are the ones that are UI because they deal with the user interface 
and we have them separated by area. So there's a UI checkout uh, where we keep all the tasks related to the checkout that I was showing you, uh, the checkout function for books. And then uh, UI users is where we keep um, things related to like fees and fines. So you're going to find that we have a bunch of different uh, projects that we use depending on the area. Um, but, but yeah, you should be able to look at anything without being logged in. Holly or Kate, um, is there a, a way to visualize uh, what's happening in our current or recent sprint? There are, yeah. So we have, um, I don't know if, if uh, if you can see them, Holly, but for example, there's some saved filters. So you can always, if you click on issues, you can always search for issues. Um, <clears throat> so if you click search over on the left, Holly, under favorite, under manage filters, and type in sprint, I just wanna see, I've actually never done this, sprint 26, space, sp space 26. Yeah, let's see, because I have a saved filter that is shared called Sprint 26. Okay, so yeah, so these are, um, these are saved filters. So you can see, well, so you can click on, try Sprint 25, Just click on Sprint 25. This is an example of a saved filter. This one shows you all of the work that was in Sprint 25. Um, and it's possible that the one that I created for Sprint 26, I haven't actually shared with everyone yet, which is why it may not have okay. come up. But you can see here all the work items and, and the green ones are um, our user stories. But we have a lot of other things in here. The red ones are bugs. Um, we've got new features and tasks. Basically what happens is, is um, you know, the product owners will write up a user story um, for the, in the UI project, as Holly mentioned. And then the developers will review it and they'll think about, okay, what are all the kind of like technical enabling tasks that need to be done to make this happen. Cause it's not all in the UI. There's obviously lots of backend work that goes into it as well. And so they'll kind of decompose the UI story um, and they may create other stories and technical tasks in other projects and they link them all together. So if you click on a, a UI story, you'll see links um, to all of the technical tasks. So that's why when you look at, you know, a given sprint, you see a lot more than just the kind of use user stories that Holly was talking about, because what you're also looking at are, you know, is a combination of oh, those, yeah. those yeah. user stories and all the tasks that go into them. Yeah, Jira is great for reporting. I mean, if you wanted to look at, so you can see all these labels. This looks like something that was just carried over. I think we targeted it for many sprints, but just didn't actually get to it. So you can see it was kind of tagged with many different sprints. So if you just click on a label for any of those sprints, that will also do a quick search, um, you know, for anything with that label. So Jira is really, really quite user friendly and easy to use. So even, you know, without a login, you can kind of just go in and click around. Um, and see what's in there. Okay, I think it's time to wrap up. Uh, thanks again to Holly and Kate and to everyone who asked questions today. Uh, this concludes today's Folio Forum on the Folio development process. It takes a community. You can continue the conversation at the Folio discussion website, discuss.folio.org, and on Twitter using the hashtag Folio Forum. The recording of today's forum will be posted soon on the openlibraryenvironment.org website. If you have feedback on this forum or have an idea for a future forum, please contact the forum facilitators at facilitators at olay list dot openlibraryfoundation.org. Our next Folio Forum will be on Wednesday, December 13th with the topic of Folio End of the Year Review. And you can go to that same website for more details and the link to register. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.
Thanks all. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.